Welcome to the Modernize or Die podcast, CFML News Edition, where we keep you up to date with everything going on in the Cold Fusion community. We'll share the latest news on events, releases to engines, frameworks, libraries, and tools, as well as spotlighting quality content from the community. Welcome back to the Modernizer Die CFML News Edition podcast. And this week is December 23rd, a special day. It's Monday instead of our normal Tuesday. And I've got a very special guest. We're giving the gift of Ben Adel this Christmas. How you doing, Ben? Very good. Super excited to be here. Very cool. So you got big Christmas plans. I heard you said you were traveling as well. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of a of a uh, seasonal island and this is not the season so there's about <laughs> 10 people here and uh it's quiet and cold and uh it gives me an excuse to uh to make a fire which is really exciting very cool very cool well i'm all excited because it's christmas and i got my christmas present from october Fest. the shirt got delivered this week so pretty pretty stoked about that but uh we got a few people in the chat room it looks like uh saying we had been on here a few people were trying to call the bluff here but you're here you're in the flesh <laughs> this is happening <laughs> yeah and i got a few people saying that they never got their photo with you but uh i think it was david bellinger said that you retired from cf too soon but you're not retired from cf are you no, no, I'm still writing Cold Fusion every day. Um, it has been a little while since I've been to a conference. I think the last conference I was at was the uh, CF Objective when it moved to DC. Um, and I guess what they, I don't know, is that conference still running? Do they just take a break? Um, after DC, they've had a break. I don't know if it's coming back this year or not, because I think DC was the year before. So I know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot Everybody going tells on. me to get out to a CF Summit. I haven't been to CF Summit. I hear that's a pretty great time, but yeah, it's a it's a big event. You know, a lot of people there, and uh, but I know that you have you been to into the box yet? Did you make it to one? No, not yet. Uh, you should, because that's where all the modern CFML is now. Obviously, we use Lucy and all the cool stuff that you're writing about. Uh, you know, you get a lot of the same speakers, but they push a little more with uh, into the box. It's a you know, CF Summit has usually about 250 people there that have never been to a conference before. And a lot of them are nice. new to cold fusion. So a lot of the topics are pretty entry level, we say, but, uh, we definitely, um, turn it up for into the box. So you can really get your learning on hurt your head and, uh, you know, but have fun too. That's in Houston, but we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. I know you're listening to the podcast. So you hear our updates every week talking about the conferences. So absolutely. So very cool. So, Yep. Uh, no, Ben will not be doing any deadlifting today on the show. <laughs> Daniel Fredericks, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so, okay. Well, we'll see if we can get some uh, questions. Oh, so Brad said, if you come to Into the Box 2020, we can get a dedicated photo booth for, <laughs> for you. And we'll get it hooked up so it live tweets on Twitter. I like it. I think, uh, hey, we know this might be a paid position because we might like triple our numbers if we get Ben photos. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> when uh, so when is into the box? Into the box is in May. So um, the we have three days, and it'll be the sixth through the eighth. Usually the sixth is workshops, and then we have two days of conferences. It's two tracks, um, but yeah, there's a lot of good content. We have you know like Nolan, uh, Tony Junkins has been there before, uh, Uma, and you know comes out and speaks and stuff. So we have a lot of nice. you know like non cold boxy people out there too. So I know you use framework one um, and stuff. So before we jump into the news though, so you want to tell us a little more about Envision because obviously you're probably one of the most successful cold fusion apps around that we're, we're aware of. So how much cold fusion, you know, I know you're using angular in the front. So I want to give us like a, a five minute sort of rundown of what your app is and how it works and the, the stack behind it. Yeah, sure. So uh, Envision is a, collaboration and prototyping platform uh, that allows designers and engineers and product managers and other types of project stakeholders to collaborate on projects and uh, bring them forward, hopefully with more success than they would otherwise. Um, it's, it, it's, it was built on Cold Fusion 8, I think, originally, and then upgraded eventually to Cold Fusion 10. And we actually sat on Cold Fusion 10 for about six years. I think. Wow. Um, yeah. So it was, it was, I mean, that's a little bit why I think I've sort of fallen out of the, the scene is, is, uh, there's only so much I could do, right? Like you're, you're on this, not antiquated, but 
aging. Let's call it rapidly <laughs> aging technology. And you're seeing all this great stuff come out, of, you know, Cold Fusion 2016, Cold Fusion 2018, all the Lucy stuff. And you're like, you know, oh, it's, team. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got <can't> play. <laughs> oh, it is. It's so, it, it's, it's so sad. And um, I mean, even the Angular stuff. So, so right now we're even still on Angular 1.22, which is, you know, seven years old at this point. And we have bits of uh, React mixed in. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, we, uh, a fellow engineer on my team, this guy, Sean Grigson, has, has been uh, trying to get us to convert it over to Lucy for about five years. And, and there were certain limitations on Lucy that didn't quite, I think, jive with how we deployed things mm -hmm. um, from, a, from a platform automation standpoint. But uh, then he checked back, I think, in 5.2, and all of the boxes were finally ticked. Cool. And so he spent about three months converting our entire Cold Fusion 10 application over to uh, be Lucy 5.2 compatible. And, uh, and it's just, I mean, it's been a game changer. Uh, it's like it's reignited, I think, my joy and, uh, and love of Cold Fusion. And, and, and your uh, blog, yeah. which is everybody else's right, joy. Exactly. And love so and it's passion. given me a whole lot more to write about. Yeah. Um, and we're hoping to upgrade from 5.2 to uh, whatever, like the 5.3. Point three, point six two. So we're trying to make that final dot jump uh, in the next couple of weeks. Cool. So how many people are just still doing cold fusion at your company? If that's something you're allowed to share, <laughs> it's uh, let's call it a diminishing number of people. Unfortunately, yeah, um, that happens. <laughs> I yeah, I, I you know I write cold fusion and Angular all day every day. That's my uh, that's my sort of corner of the organization. Um, we have a lot of newer services that are being built and deployed. Uh, a lot of that is being written in Golang these days. Oh, Go, cool. I don't know if anyone calls it Golang. <laughs> but um I'm not supposed I, to, I, but <laughs> yeah. I, I look at Golang, I look at the Go code and it just seems not as not as joyful to me. But, yeah, I'll tell you what though. I mean, those the the it runs on such a small like footprint yeah. and everything. Like it's super quick to spin up. I mean, I'm I'm kind of curious. I haven't actually looked at any Go, um, but I know that it runs a lot of stuff and it's super quick uh, and super deployable. So I'd like to learn more about it. So I understand that's definitely a thing for like microservices and or just new services. People are heading that way. Yeah, but certainly for the let's call it foreseeable future, I'm gonna be chugging away on on lucy so pretty excited about that myself very cool very cool okay so one other question we usually ask is so when did you start working with cold fusion do you remember yes uh i think it was to uh 1999 i think i i got an internship at a company that did cold fusion um, and I have a very clear recollection of one of my bosses standing there with the uh, macro, I think it was Macromedia Cold Fusion 4.5 book in his hands <laughs> and being like, let's upgrade from 4 to 4.5. And uh, he wasn't talking to me, he was talking to the, uh, the CTO behind me. But <laughs> um, it, was, it was awesome. I, yeah. I, I had before that been dabbling in uh, ASP Classic and, uh, and PHP. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I tried Cold Fusion, it was just game changer. Right? Yeah, it just made sense. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I know this sounds crazy. There are going to be people who think this is ridiculous. But even to this day, I still write a lot of my uh, SQL code in Cold Fusion tags, like CF Query and CF Query Param tags, just because, like, having a giant block of SQL and, you know, with some sort of conditional stuff occasionally. I mean, that was to me, that was, was always one of the hugest selling points for cold fusion was, was how easy it made writing. SQL. Oh yeah. I remember in PHP trying to do string concatenation crap and oh yeah, gosh, it crazy. hurts. And it's, yeah, just, just painful. So cool. Well, glad to have you, uh, again, a uh, special day, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, sorry, they're making jokes about how often you say game changer. So I threw one in there too, just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, too funny. So, okay, well, let's get on with some news. So, um, for those like yourself who didn't make it to CF Summit in Las Vegas, um, the videos are finally being released. So they did record all the sessions. 
um, and they've started releasing some. So uh, the links in the show notes will be for the Facebook and the YouTube channels, and uh, they have a link for all the slides too. But so so far we have uh, um, I'm going to mispronounce his name as usual. The Ashish Gag, um, the um, he's doing the the keynote. So they released the keynote there, and also uh, if you haven't seen Vin. Uh, Min Vo, uh, his stuff will hurt your brain, Ben. This is awesome. Reinforcement learning with Cold Fusion by Min Vo. Uh, his session was really good. I mean, it literally, everybody walked out of there holding their heads like, oh, <laughs> it was awesome. But like, just the stuff that he did, it's, it's pretty cool. So it's like, you know, reinforcement learning, AI stuff. And so those two videos are out right now. Okay. Um, it's pretty pretty dang cool and they're going to be releasing more over the next few days so get your you know basically adobe cold fusion is giving you some free videos to check out if you missed it or even if you're in another session because they have like five tracks so so there's some really good sessions there and i'm eagerly awaiting how bad mine is going to turn out so (laughs) (laughs) but yeah so those are all available up there um and yeah, and I mean, CF Summit is a good conference. You'd probably enjoy that. And there's a lot of great people there, too. You know, I always like catching up with everybody. And um, yeah, so. Uh, the, the, for- the biggest, the, the thing that makes me nervous about CF Summit is just the location. Being in Las Vegas, I'm a fairly introverted person. Yeah. And I feel like thinking about being in Vegas is a little bit overwhelming, but. Yeah, I mean, you could live in the hotel, go down the conference area and then out. But, you know, a lot of people just hang out there. Um but I always go to Top Golf with a few people. Go to the Brazilian Steakhouse just down the road, and you know, Absolutely. it's 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 a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun, and we do those um, we do those uh, trainings as well. So Audis always does like a two day training before or after, mm-hmm. and so um, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty good. Um, we always hang out in the suite. We get a whole suite for each room, and then we can just hang out in the suite. It's we have a lot of fun so nice. um yeah and then even you can sort of stay in the room if you need to so so yeah but okay well the next thing on the list is uh if you want to up your query game ben qb7 is being released so qb is a fluent query builder for cfml um it's mm-hmm. heavily based on uh, eloquent from laravel and uh, so eric peterson uh he brought this one over um, so 7.0 does have breaking changes. So if anyone's using it and they uh, want to try it out, make sure you go through the migration guide to make sure you you know fix any of those little changes. Um, and the docs have been completely revamped. So uh, Query Build is pretty cool. Um, but the cool thing about it is that it it basically it's a builder style. So you you know you sort of have um, little closures for everything. So if you want to do a an you know a where statement, it's, you do a dot where. Uh, if you want to join tables and basically you give it all these commands out of order, the order doesn't really matter. And then at the end it builds it. So instead of having an if statement in four different places in the same query, if you're, you know, joining tables based on criteria and stuff, you can basically have one if statement with a, a few commands. And then if they're in there, they're in there. You can do the select, the join and the where for that all in that if statement. But if, if the if statement's not true, you don't have to worry about going and changing it in four different places and stuff gotcha. like that. So it's pretty cool. Uh, Eric Peterson's clapping in the chat. Uh, but yeah, QB7 is released. He had it in beta since um, I think we finished at CF Summit. He was hacking on it at CF Summit in the, in the suite or after training and everything. But it's being released. So if you guys um, didn't check it out, and so you're asking, is it like SQLize? I think I think so. Um, gotcha. Yeah, double a check. Extra. Yeah, and there's a lot of tools like that, but uh, it's pretty cool. And um, yeah, Eric added a lot of new stuff in in the QB7, so pretty cool. You should check that one out. But yeah, there's there are some benefits having a big block of SQL for sure. But if you're starting to do like really complex like search um, sort of filters and everything, where your query starts looking like a cold fusion soup, then this will <laughs> definitely help. Yeah, I mean, it's cool that you pass the query into a function and you can almost like abstract a lot of your, you know, your code out into little helper functions that build the query for you. It's pretty, pretty slick. So the other thing too, in case you guys missed it, um, Charlie Earhart hosted um, the online Cold Fusion meetup last Thursday. So I was uh, lucky enough to present my 
uh, start doing integrated testing. So we did that last Thursday. Um, looked like everybody enjoyed it. There was one question that people asked at the end. They were wondering if we could use integrated, which is another one of Eric's modules, which is based on Laravel, um, <laughs> for testing. If we could use it without Coldbox, the framework. And Eric basically told us that um, the cool thing is since uh, since all the Coldbox, you know, should we say um, piping and, you know, all that under the cover stuff is done for Coldbox, since all that is sort of tied in so deeply with integrated, if you really wanted to use integrated like features uh, without a framework, you probably should look at using something. Um, now, of course, I've completely lost my memory of it was Cypress. That's what it was, Cypress. So if you want to do like fully integrated testing, instead of having to build all that into integrate and everything, you should probably use Cypress if you're not using Coldbox already. If you're using Framework 1, you could probably build an adapter for it, but uh, Cypress is a great tool uh, and you know, sort of go from there. So, and then one more uh, piece of news in January 16th, 2020, uh, Rakshif is going to be doing a uh, uh, Cold Fusion for the next decade, all about the buzzworthy Cold Fusion 2020 webinar. So you guys can register for that online. Um, and that's, uh, that's going to be in a couple of weeks in, in January. So he's going to give you all the, all the information about, um, you know, what's coming in 2020 and what's coming in the future of Cold Fusion too. So if you guys are interested in that, um, you can sign up for that as well. So cool. So that's sort of the news, not a whole lot there, but we have some conference updates. So again, two weeks left for you guys to put your submission for call for speakers for into the box. So if you guys want to speak, I know you're not much of a speaker, Ben, but if you really wanted to with a, you know, you can go to papercall.io slash ITB 2020 and submit a topic or two. And then Be interesting. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you got lots of cool stories. I mean, you could talk about, you know, just the migration, you know, of over time going from a CF, you know, eight app to Lucy and all the things you're sort of gone as challenge. I mean, I'm sure you've got scaling stories and stuff like that. I mean, there's, there's stuff you could share. <laughs> I tell you, I mean, there's, there's gotta be some experiences you could share and people like hearing that sort of like in the trenches type story, but I'm not forcing you to speak, but if you wanted to, uh, the, it's open. We're um, going to be closing that, I believe, January 15th. So uh, Christmas time, you guys got a couple, you know, hopefully you got some time off. You can maybe, you know, put a presentation in there. But the conference is in May, 6th to 8th. 6th is workshops. 7th and 8th is a two-day, uh, two-track um, conference. So we usually have about 30 sessions. Uh, it's in uh, the Woodlands, just outside of Houston. Uh, it's a great venue, and uh, we always have a lot of fun. And... <laughs> and David Ballinger just said, please teach us how to blog. So there you go, Ben. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you find 28 hours a day to blog on top of your normal life? I don't know. <laughs> I go to bed very early. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. You're just not tired all the time. So, but yeah, so end of the box 2020. Um, and then we're, we're going to be having an end of the box and let him. Uh, Latin America as well. That uh, it was a success. We had that a couple of weeks back and everything went really well. So we're already planning the next one in Latin America. So uh, if you guys want to try some you know, different food and get out of the country, you could always go to that one, Ben. El Salvador is where we held the Latin America one. Um, and we also have a couple more um, conferences. So last week we talked about Dev Nexus. So Brad and Luis have been going for years. The Fusion Reactor guys go. I think even Adobe uh, were there a couple of years back. So Dev Nexus is February 19th to 21 in Atlanta, Georgia. And then uh, for those of you doing Vue, um, ViewConf is going to be in Austin this year. So or next year, I guess, March 2nd through 4th, 2020. Uh, so that's ViewConf in the U.S., and then DockerCon is another one that we've been to before. Uh, that's going to be held in Austin, Texas from June 15th to 18th. So there's just a couple of other conferences that are, you know, pretty good, um, pretty good conferences for those who are working there. Now, have you, do you still go to any of the Angular conferences? Have you been to ng-conf? I haven't been to ng-conf yet. I, I, I just haven't been good about conferences lately. The last couple of years, it's been it's it's hard. I mean, I have to go, so I, that's why I go. <laughs> it's part of my job. So, but it's hard to make the time. You know, you never have enough time. But um, if you guys are looking for Angular Conf, NG Conf is uh, April first to third uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah. So, if you guys are looking at uh, maybe attending an Angular conference, I'd need to go just to find out the difference between Angular one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, and nine. <laughs> 
Because I think they missed yeah. six, didn't they? Or is there six? I don't know the difference. <laughs> there was a, they did skip one, and two is radically different than one. Radically different. Yeah, and that's the thing is I, I think three and four, I think seven and eight is the second version of three and four. That The numbers confuse me. So, anyways. <laughs> but the one thing I do like about the NG uh, comp, they actually had an NG cruise where you have a, uh, you know, a cruise ship. And we've been talking about into the box cruise um, because one of our, one of our customers is a travel agent and they do a lot of cruises and stuff. And so I've been telling them and they said, yeah, we should do it. But I think the orders team said we should do a cruise after our conference so we can actually relax because if we're doing the <laughs> conference on the boat, we're not going to be relaxing when we work and it's, it's way more work than you think. Yeah, but, absolutely. So maybe after into the box, we should have into the box post conference cruise and we could just chill for a few days and unwind. But anyway, so, so that's our conference. And now we're going to get into the blog tweets and videos of the week. And you know that you're going to be featured here. So uh, be ready. <laughs> but um, the first blog post we have is another one from Matt Gifford. Um, and so he was talking about CFML content moderation detection component library. And so he started off his blog by saying, another day, another API. And so this one's kind of interesting. Um, so he has a, a, you know, a client that he's working with, and their people are uploading images and videos and stuff and needed a way to like moderate it. So he was looking at maybe creating something uh, or, you know, looking for something out there. And so he started searching APIs to see how he could, you know, check for the stuff. Cause obviously a lot of sites don't want pornographic imagery or hateful images and nastiness yeah. and, you know, that happens. Right. And so he found a, a thing called pick Purif purify. And so this API allows you to basically, you know, run this little, um, run it through the API and you can tell it what things you want to search for. If you're looking for pornographic info, you know, or nudity or whatever, and tell it what you're looking for. And it'll tell you if the image contains it or not uh, using its AI algorithms and stuff. And there's a free tier for a certain like 2000 calls or something per day. And so he's written a little wrapper and thrown it up on Forgebox. So nice. pretty cool. Someone, uh, uh, my manager who, uh, my project manager who lives out in Lithuania said that, I don't know if this is true, but in Europe, they're going to be passing laws about uploading uh, copyrighted material and, and platforms are going to be, have to become responsible for determining whether or not people are uploading copyrighted wow. things, which yeah. that seems like you're going to need an API for that for sure. Yeah, I'm sure someone's going to make a lot of money with, with that type of thing. I know uh, last week we were talking about, um, you know, the holiday programs and stuff. And my, my daughter had a ban thing and I uploaded all the videos because the grandparents weren't able to make it. And so it was crazy how it could pick 30 seconds out of their song. That was like the nutcracker piece. And it just muted that piece perfectly. And like, it's That's so crazy. I mean, it's like terrible audio, high school kids playing music, you know, across the big auditorium and it could still pick out the stuff. So, I mean, it's smart enough out there, but yeah, if you're gonna have to like scan for copyright for every, that's gonna be crazy. No, yeah, nuts, but nuts. So, but anyway, so thanks, Matt, for that. And then uh, Michaela and TerraTech released a uh, Adobe CF Summit India comprehensive report. So there's a link here in the show notes, which will give you all the rundown of what happened in CF India. So a lot of the sessions and some interviews there too. So um, they include a lot of videos with the speakers, which is pretty cool. So. Okay. And then um, now this one's yours. So the next blog post we have is from Ben Adele. Surprise, surprise. So this one, you're talking about getting cold fusion date objects from UTC milliseconds and Lucy, and you ran into a weird locking um, issue. Well, we actually ran into, so we ran into two issues. Um, essentially what we were doing was the browser was posting UTC milliseconds for a date from the, you know, from the client side over to the server side. And this is the code we haven't touched in seven years. And uh, in Adobe Cold Fusion 10 and earlier, we would take that UTC milliseconds, convert it into this Java date, uh, and then and then format it, I guess, as UTC. I, I didn't even know there was some date formatter class in Java. I'd never seen it before. Hmm. Um, which apparently right in the Java doc says it's completely not thread safe. Don't use it. Uh, which I don't know, for whatever reason, it hadn't caused huge issues. But the crazy thing was that as I was fixing the deadlocking code, what I discovered too was that, um, so I think Cold Vision 10 and earlier, 
uh, the uh, time stand, I mean, time zones are horrible, right? And I think yeah. everybody does not enjoy Dates working with them. Yep. <laughs> but what I realized with this code that was seven years old, uh, people were taking this UTC milliseconds, converting it to a date, sticking to the database, but it was actually being stored as like 12 hours prior somehow. So actually, I probably shouldn't commit to this on any kind of recorded session, but <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some dates that are definitely off in, in, in a very uh, small part of the system. Um, and we actually, because Lucy, you know, even in like the date convert method function, it says that it's not even a recommended function. They keep it just for compatibility with Adobe Confusion because uh, time zones are not even associated with the dates. So anytime you format a date, you have to ask it or you have to tell it which time zone to format it in. Yeah. It's, and then yeah. it gets tricky too because if you put a time zone on the data source, it assumes that, uh, yeah, it converts it based on that. But if your browser is in one thing, your server is in another, and your database is in another, and the data source is set differently, it can really mess you up. I hate time zones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Long story short, I hate time zones. Uh, and then everything run in UTC. <laughs> so that's the only solution. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you throw daylight savings in there too, and you got a bigger problem. Oh. Yeah. I was listening to another podcast complaining about daylight savings, and I was like, wait, you guys are complaining that it just switched back to normal time, and you're saying daylight savings is stupid, but you don't like the time. I'm like, you guys got it backwards. <laughs> but anyway, so. That's cool. Interesting. But yeah, it's just kind of crazy. You run into all these little things, but I yeah, always, always have fun going back and forth from um, UCC and the fact that milliseconds are just, you know, JavaScript milliseconds and they just don't add up the same. But yeah. <laughs> so you also were playing with uh, another blog post that you had was error variable randomly exists after running CF execute in Lucy. So. Yeah, this is a this is a weird one. Um, this was part of CF Execute. I don't use CF Execute a whole lot. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm trying. I'm currently in the middle of trying to debug this weird memory usage issue uh, in a part of our application. And what I was hoping was to be able to tap into the JPS and JMAP debugging functionalities that come with. Uh, we're using OpenJDK, I think, and. Um, and I was, you know, writing code that would dip down to the command line using CF execute. And uh, you can tell CF execute to populate a variable or an error variable. Mm -hmm. And I just assumed that the error variable would only exist if an error occurred. Uh, and it seems to randomly exist whether or not an error happens and it's populated with an empty string. So it's not just enough to check to see if the error is null. You have to check if it's not null and if it actually has data in it but only sometimes <laughs> only sometimes yeah, yeah. i saw a, a little tweet thread that you and brad were discussing some stuff on there were a couple other people i think about this and yeah it's, yeah, it's, it's something called process builder which i haven't played around with yet but it seems interesting yeah uh, that's one thing uh, yeah brad always seems to know all this java stuff i never dived that deep but there's always something i mean i know that we've used the, the main java one that i use is like string builder when working with queries and you're doing really big mm -hmm. queries that always like build a string that way because string concatenation is terrible in cold fusion by default so if you're doing a lot of that the string builder is good but yeah, the process builder sounds like it would work better. But yeah, CF execute. I used to use that in the old days for you know CF image magic and everything and oh, it was yeah. so unreliable, you know, before the CF image stuff got better. But yeah, I used to hate going to the black hole of CF execute, you know. It's almost like throwing it stuff into a thread and hoping it comes back alive. <laughs> 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 but yeah. So well, that's cool. But yeah, so if you guys want to read that, so Ben's uh, got a nice blog post talking about that interesting experience. We also have another blog uh, from Fusion Reactor. So they talked about moving from Confluence to MK Docs. And it's not necessarily a Cold Fusion related thing, but they're talking about how they've been using Confluence for years and the search engine results weren't, you know, very favorable and all they had their own server and all sorts of headaches and everything. And so they're moving to MK Docs. And so it's Christmas time. If you're not doing a whole lot of work, maybe you want to do some document migration. This is kind of an interesting story. It looks like some good features, and uh, but they're pretty happy with the move so far. So pretty cool. So there was also uh, a blog post from uh, Jason Steinhauer. So he's using .NET integration services with Command Box. Um, so as he mentions, you know, he loves 
using command box for working with CFML, but he needed to work with this .NET integration feature. And so he basically walks you through how he got it up and running for your local environment. So pretty neat. So you're using command box now, right? I know you're a little slow picking up some of the orders products, but <laughs> yeah, command box. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've only scratched the surface. Uh, basically I use it just to do quick tests and, and play around with Lucy. Um, but it's, I mean, it, I don't even understand how it works. It's just awesome. Like, yeah. I don't understand how it boots up so fast. I don't know if that's just, I'm, you know, historically used to using Adobe Cold Fusion and Lucy just boots super fast. <laughs> but like I do box and it starts and I hit start and like I have a server immediately and I could do it in any version. I mean, it's kind of, it's awesome. I, I still haven't, I still haven't created a, um, a module or whatever. Uh, yeah. Is that for Forge? That's for Forge box. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of it, but Command Box also has its own module. So you could actually make your own little uh, function. So maybe you guys have certain things you do a lot at work. You could actually make your own like internal module that you just use and it could mm. do some of the, the stuff that you, you know, I mean, I made a little choose your own adventure game and, you know, there's little things that someone made a, a module for Command Box so you can use ng-grok to share your server like out there and there's a whole bunch of cool ones out on forge box but i mean yeah you can make your own little you know if you guys do a lot of angular apps and you if you create little mini apps or something you can make your own little scaffold that so it scaffolds stuff out your way you know so it's got a lot of cool features and the ripple is pretty neat just for just testing out some some code right in the command line just to see if it works or what would what would this return you know (laughs) so you just throw it in the ripple and i mean yeah Brad. Well, I mentioned I, I mentioned I've been trying to debug this uh, memory usage issue that we're having, um, and one of the things I do is so I have we use uh, Docker for all of our main stuff, so I'll have my whole thing spin up in Docker, and then I'll create uh, a command box based server just to do uh, like scripted load testing against the main app. Okay, and so it's super easy. Like I just spin up, you know, write a couple of uh, CFHTTP calls and start hammering the the Docker situation. I mean, cool. it's too, uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, so well, that's pretty cool. I mean, we definitely love it, and Brad's working hard on the next release of that too. It should be out here pretty soon. Some pretty big upgrades under the covers, and all the the main libraries are using. So, pretty excited to see that. And then uh, we have a, a blog and another one from Ray Camden. So he's obviously blogging a lot about Vue.js and a lot of JavaScripty stuff. So we don't usually feature a lot of his stuff here, but. This one here, he's talking about building a Sudoku app in Vue.js. And so this is part two, but um, this is basically a, a finished version of the app. So I thought if you guys want to you know, check out Vue.js, if you haven't used it before or you want to see how it works, he's basically built so, a Sudoku game in it, and you can go check out the code and you know play a little game. But I thought it'd be kind of cool, a cool little app for you to look at over the holidays if you want to you know, dip your toes into Vue.js, see how Ray's doing it and you know, play a little game. So yeah, Ray is still the king. I don't know how he puts out as much as he does. Yeah. Well, that's most of the time it's his job. You know, he's usually a, you know, <laughs> a, a, a dev rel, you know, so he's in developer relations and that's usually his job is to blog about stuff. And I think he's working for that mapping company now, the, the help. No, what here, the here mapping company. Mm. Um, but yeah, he's worked for, you know, several places, uh, developer relations guy right but, right but yeah but um but yeah a lot of stuff in view so i, I like what reading your stuff still because I, I do a lot of view stuff too so pretty excited about that cool and then another blog post we have from andrew dixon so he was talking about looping over cfml uh, over dates in cfml and i guess it all started um in the cfml slack channel so there's a lot of people in there and they're chit-chatting about looping over the the range but i guess if you just loop over the date normally, it does, uh, you know, you loop a day at a time. So they were talking about, you know, how would you do just a few hours or whatnot? And they were saying, I wonder if you can put a decimal place in there or something and for the step and you can. And so they were talking about, you know, doing that and how to work with it and stuff. So an interesting little blog post on that, but yeah, you just loop over the date, just put in a decimal, which, you know, breaks it down to an hour or whatever, and you can loop every hour through through dates. Just pretty neat when you think about it. Pretty flexible. It's cool. it's, there's a lot of, uh, sorry, not to go off on like a tangent for a second, but uh, I, one of the great things, uh, 
Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Collect my thoughts. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the sort of unsung things about Cold Fusion is that it just, not unsung, but uh, it's like these little things that just make it so pleasant to work with, whether or not it's looping over dates or arrays or queries and automatic scoping of variables and everything. I don't, it's just a lot of things that it, it does very elegantly. It's nice. Yeah. I'm looking forward to some of the new stuff coming out. I mean, with 2022 and then Lucy six is that's, you know, I'm not sure when that'll be coming out, but they're doing they're you know, they got to the point where there's a lot of great features in them already, but they're just adding yeah. those little things that just make developer life better. And that's, yeah, that, those are little things like you mentioned is why I, I like cold fusion still. And I've looked at other languages and, and stuff, but yeah. Again, I'd be curious to know. Sorry, not to cajole. I'm just curious, like the people in the chat. Like, has anyone gone like full Lucy syntax with like the full null support and the dot Lucy files? I've seen that in the docs. I I have no opportunity because I'm working on so much legacy stuff. But I'm like, that's at some point you become not a compatibility platform, right, with Adobe <laughs> Cofusion, but you become, you know, its own language. I don't know if anyone else has any experience with that. Yeah, I know that they had. They used to have like meetings about the lucy language like they'd have meetings they had like a co uh, a committee that would meet all the time about a lot of that stuff for a while and but yeah i mean i think these days i don't know of anyone actually using the dot lucy you know i don't know mm -hmm. of anyone doing that but but yeah i mean i think i think just having the the normal versions and just adding those new features in it is is pretty cool as it is oh yeah I mean, I, I told people a long time ago that if they were going to make CFML cool again, they needed to change the name of the file extension. It would be like .zombie or something, and then they could call it you know, a different <laughs> language completely, and no one would know it was CF anymore because it was like zombie files or something. Just something weird and cool that, you know, it would still be the code, just, you know, change the prefix on the tags, and nobody would know. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, too funny. But... Uh, anyways, so uh, you have another blog post here, Ben. You've been busy this week. Um, leaking about leaking your logly JSON passing bookmarklet to your JSON Explorer app. So you're talking about using logly for logging aggregating. But I thought this was kind of interesting because obviously a lot of us work with JSON these days. So you want to tell us a little yeah. more about this? Yeah. So this is, I don't know if, if this will date me. I've been around for quite a while now and uh, way, way back in the day, I think with Firefox, I used to use this thing called grease monkey and grease monkey was essentially a way to inject JavaScript code that you wrote into any page, like would detect which URL you are in. It would just inject a piece of JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know that they make probably a thousand and one Chrome plugins that do this, uh, but I'm, I, we, we have a huge uh, security presence at our company and security is like, very front and center of a lot of the thinking that we do. Um, and I'm like a little terrified to install Chrome plugins because like, I don't know what's actually in that. Uh, I, I don't know if that makes me sound overly uh, cautious, but um, I guess you so can go look at the files, JavaScript, right? Can, <laughs> can you do that with a Chrome plugin? I, I guess it, it's just JavaScript running on your page. Yeah, your, I guess so. I have to go look myself. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, now I'm curious because yeah. it opens up a whole new opportunity. So anyway, so instead of installing um, things like Grease Monkey scripts or, or user-defined uh, scripts, I use bookmarklets, which is essentially a way to use the URL to execute JavaScript. Uh, and then I use that to inject my JavaScript into pages that I'm currently on. Um, and in this case, I uh, was injecting additional script into Logly that would take a log entry uh, it pretty prints it on the screen. And then if you want to, you can also send that JSON over as part of the URL hash to this other uh, app that I wrote that um, kind of simulates sort of a CF dump style uh, output to, uh, to be able to essentially open up log items in different tabs so that I could keep track of them over time. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, it's a... Uh, you know, one of the one of the best things about being a web developer, and I think everyone here can can share this feeling, is you have an idea, and you also have, you know, for the most part, the skills to go and make that happen, right? And that's mm -hmm. it's super empowering. So I see a limitation in an app that I'm using, and I write some JavaScript to tinker with it, and then suddenly it's doing what I want. And uh, I don't know, it's a super it's a super powerful feeling. 
That's cool. I haven't messed with a lot of that, but yeah, when you think about it, that's pretty neat. I didn't know that you could just inject that way, so I might have to oh, yeah. mess with that. Oh, that's great. Uh oh, now you got me running off on another shiny object. <laughs> 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 oh well, it's Christmas time. I got a little time, so cool. Well, yeah, and like I said, that one's. I know it wasn't, you know, specifically Cold Fusion, but I thought just. I mean, it sounded really interesting. You know the with the bookmarklets and everything. So I thought we'd share that with everybody. Good. Cool. And then um, I just saw a, a note pop up here on the chat here. So um, Ben K said, you're right to be concerned about a lot of, uh, about the, the Chrome mm -hmm. extensions or whatever. Cause I guess he's saying a lot of companies are requiring old plugins from the creators and then inserting all their like nasty data collecting and ad stuff. And so, mm -hmm. So even though it might have been a good plugin before, like when they update and the new company's taken over, you don't know if you can trust it anymore, which is even scarier. <laughs> well, yeah, totally. And this is how uh, some of those NPM issues have happened, right? Where people, people become part of an open source project, seemingly legitimately at first, get committal rights. Yeah. And then, you know, as time passes, they put something malicious in. It's, it's, uh, it's scary yeah. out there. Yep. It sure is. And then I guess Charlie just mentioned that Brad's video, um, please pass the salt just got posted to the CF summit videos. Um, so I guess he, they're still emailing and releasing those videos. So we, early we mentioned that the, some of the videos have been released, I guess they're going to be trickling them out over this holiday period. So thanks for that update, Charlie. Uh, so Pete also had another, uh, a blog post about running Postgres in Docker for local dev. So, He's previously talked about SQL Server and my uh, Oracle um, on a Mac with Docker, and so he basically ran through how you can get Postgres up and running. Uh, what database are you guys using? Is that something you're allowed to say? I don't know security and all that. Yeah, I don't think it's an issue. We use a uh, MySQL. Okay. Um, and for the most, I, I think most of the teams use MySQL. We use a little bit of MongoDB, and then I think some teams use. Uh, Postgres for things that have very Postgres specific functionality, but for the most part, we're a MySQL shop. Cool. Yeah. Most people I know that are using Postgres are usually doing something with uh, the geospatial stuff. Like it got on that very quickly and a lot of JSON stuff too. I know MySQL and MSQL can the later versions too, but Postgres was pretty onto it pretty quickly with that. So I got a, a friend that does a lot of uh, mapping stuff and he's, yeah, loves Postgres for that. I mean, I know people who love Postgres, like love Postgres. Um, I've never used it personally just because I've been pretty happy with MySQL. Yeah. Well, I know that Rails people all use Postgres to start with. So that's why it's, mm. if they haven't used Rails and they're using Postgres, I usually ask why and it's mapping. But <laughs> I don't know. But it looks pretty cool. Uh, I, I think I used it way back, probably in 2000 two or three like way back when we were running a windows shop at that time and someone had a linux set up and so we couldn't use the database we were using on on linux so we had to use postgres so I, that's the last time i used it properly so uh oh yeah and eric's saying that uh custom column types are pretty cool <laughs> so with oh, postgres nice. so Cool. And we have another blog from our computer know-how uh, talking about Couchbase and use keys for performance gains. So uh, if you guys are ever used uh, Couchbase, they have this thing called Nickel uh, in in one QL. So it's really um, so like for MongoDB and stuff. You know, when you're querying the querying your fields, uh, Couchbase has this query language that looks a lot like SQL. So it looks more like normal regular SQL. We can uh, has a couple little things in it just to give it that extra power for the the NoSQL stuff. But it looks like uh, looks like looks like regular SQL, which is pretty pretty good because most of us are used to using SQL these days. So, um, but well, anyway, yeah. So they're just talking about using use keys or whatever. Um, so a little update on that. So if you guys are using Couchbase, and I'm sure Brad and them are, they do the Couchbase extension, so they do all the hard work for me. So. <laughs> so yeah cool so uh we also got a tweet from simon femmer uh he was tweeting about an older blog post by kathy gruyonke i don't know how to say that sorry about talking about passing form data to a j from a jquery ajax call to a cfc function and returning it so for those of you guys that aren't using uh you know like modern rest apis this is sort of using a cfc to to interface through ajax uh 
we've all done this at one point um uh, but so it's interesting to so i think this blog post is a couple of years old but uh i thought we'd just share that too and then uh one last blog post we're almost there guys uh charlie um this is actually reposted from something in march i think there was a conversation on on twitter or slack about um cold fusions licensing for docker and how that works um because that's always been one of the questions about 2016 2018 you know how does it work with docker and so um he mentions uh you know basically how to find out what the licensing is like how many cores etc and obviously if you're using them development um, purposes they're all free um you know and if you uh, have production check the licensing for standard versus enterprise and the number of cores and everything else so uh, check that out so we got that link there from that so thanks charlie so the next thing on our list is our coding challenge of the month so what do you think of the coding challenge you like the idea ben uh, yeah i i love the idea so we're going to try and uh, knock them out once a month. So December's one, the first one, Luis um, brought it up because we were talking about a um, one of Ray's 13 or 15 year old uh, UPS um, basically modules. I guess it was up on Rear Forge, and so we said whoever gets it up on a Forge box and you know in a Cold Box module or whatever as soon as possible um, wins twenty five dollar you know Amazon gift card or something. So. Matt Gifford last week while watching the show live on the video finished it and put that up there and uh, <laughs> sent the link right afterwards. Uh, so Matt Gifford, the API man, <laughs> uh, so he finished that up. So we'll have to check and see if he did the update for the live uh, the URL change that's going into effect at the end of the year. But um, so congrats, Matt Gifford, and he said that uh, we can donate that to a charity of his uh, of our choice. So thanks I'll for that, sure. Matt. So, and then uh, we're going to have another one uh, starting in January. So we'll let you guys know. And I'm not sure if we're going to just do one where, you know, like this one here is obviously first come first serve, but we'll probably do one where people can submit their stuff. And we can, we'll do some type of judging or a random drawer of everyone who completes it or something. Cause I think Pete Freitag used to do like a cold fusion puzzle or something, you know? I don't yeah. Know. That sounds familiar. I know Matt, Matt Gifford has mentioned in a couple of tweets about, you know, CF puzzle or something. I don't know what it is or whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's basically something like that where it's like a little puzzle. You got to solve it. And I'd really like to get it up on code wars. I've been trying to get them to like add some cold fusion stuff up on, you know, code wars. Have you used code wars before or any of those code dojo places where they have all those questions? You've got to like answer the answer with a solution run your tests and what if they pass then you can see everybody else's solution have you seen uh, that i've heard of it i've heard of it but um i have not tried it myself so yeah we do some of those at our javascript meetup every once in a while like just we sort of go through this code kata um and you know it's kind of interesting to see all the crazy ways people can solve it you know because like everything there's a million ways to do it which way is a good way is always an interesting question so i was thinking it might be neat to do that type of thing for a coding challenge so you know write a function that takes these inputs and gives you this output and you know so we can have people doing it old school way uh, we have people doing functional you know we could do some weird stuff using alvis operators and then people can see all the differences so uh that's what I was thinking. That way, a lot of people can do it, but we can learn from each other instead of just a race to, to submit your stuff to Forgebox. Because I think the amount of packages Matt has up there, he probably has a you know one click button, create, push. <laughs> Away you go. No, I think it's a great idea. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. Cool. Okay. So, next up, we have uh, Find a Job. So we have a couple of positions here. I think these are the same as last week. So we have a full-time senior Cold Fusion developer position for Prospecta in Washington, D.C. And we have a full-time Cold Fusion developer admin for Acrea in Portland, Oregon. And then, um, so those are both available through getcfmljobs.com. And it's a Cold Fusion site that goes and scrapes all the job sites out there. And if you have a post, you can actually contact them directly and I'll post it for you. But I also saw a tweet from Moonlight. Um, so Moonlight underscore work. They had a tweet, a kind of like advertise one saying, are you looking for team members? And I guess they've got 17 Cold Fusion candidates available. So if you if you want to uh, add someone to your team, if you guys are looking for a Cold Fusion developer, maybe they're good. I don't know who they are or anything about them, but I saw the tweet. So I thought I would share it in case someone's looking for a developer. So 
Anyway, so let's go on to the next thing here. The Forge Box module, module of the Week. So I'm going to cheat this week. And uh, since the brand new uh, brand new Module of the Week is Pick Purify, I decided to make that the Module of the Week. So uh, I thought it was pretty neat. I mean, just, uh, you know, Matt obviously put the API up there. Um, and I'm kind of curious, like, I want to test it out, like send some pictures in of things that aren't really inappropriate, <laughs> like those bad, <laughs> those bad tweets you see where <laughs> it's like someone's arm, you know, there's a, a crease or something, or there's the optical illusions that, you know, you see every once in a while. I'm like, what if we send some of those? Which ones would be false negative, false positives? <laughs> so I'm going to, I might have to test that out. That could be a fun session. <laughs> so, but anyway, so that's up there. If you want to install it, you can. <laughs> <laughs> box install <laughs> pick purify and uh you can find out more about it up on forge box but uh yeah so i think that'd be interesting because obviously yeah i don't know i think it's a pretty cool api i just we did a lot of work with schools and everything uh we had a, a, a product called cyber school that we built and this would have come in really handy for that <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> anyways uh, okay, so next up, um, we're going to do our VS Code hint, tip, and trick of the week. So are you using VS Code? Is that what you're building in? <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm on Sublime Text 3. Okay, no uh, problem. After, I, I, I don't know. I'm like the slowest person to migrate off of anything new. We might have figured that out already. <laughs> 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 Me and Brad always giving you grief on you know Twitter. It's like, you know, there's this new thing called Command Box. It was just released in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. I'm finally there. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> when will I learn? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why I didn't ask Ben for his uh, <laughs> recommendation for this week. <laughs> but um, this one I found was pretty cool. Um, it's Visual Studio Online. So it's a, a Microsoft extension that they released. But the cool thing is about it is that it actually allows you um, pow a cloud-powered development environments for any activity. So if you're doing a short-term or a long-term project, you can basically connect uh, Visual Studio. Uh, and it basically, it's a browser-based editor that gets connects through to whatever your environment is. So if it's self-hosted or, or whatever, uh, it connects into your like your Docker containers, and then you can basically work like you have your own little virtual machine. And so it's through online.visualstudio.com, and we have the link in the show notes to to go look at it. But it basically allows you to sort of jump in. The Docker container has all the tools and all the libraries you need, so you don't have to install them all locally on your machine. So it's like detaches that from your machine. So, you know, if you're switching projects a lot where you've got like a whole bunch of different dependencies and different libraries you need and everything, you know, your machine is empty. You just connect to it um, via the online uh Visual Studio, and then it connects into that Docker image, and in that Docker image is the development environment. So it has all the mm -hmm. libraries, it has all the tools, and then you're just basically using, you know, it's kind of like a, a a dumb client connection to a, a server. So you've got your your Visual Studio piece, and that just connects in, and everything else is done there. So it's pretty neat. I mean, I've been reading about it for a while. I need to actually try it out, um, but they've just updated it and. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So I'm, I'm looking forward to giving that a go. So, yeah. And someone just posted here. Um, they said they use VS Code to introspect to CFC components, uh, had full argument and type hinting, which is pretty cool. Yeah, VS Code is, is really awesome. So, I mean, it's I know Sublime is good. I used it for a long time, too. Um, I liked it a lot. And it, it's still my quick open editor because I haven't changed it yet, but sublime is a good tool so yeah oh okay so charlie just said that the vs code online is free for now in preview but it will be a cost in the future but not too pricey so okay good to know so try it now while it's free and then see if it's worth it later but i was just thinking you know if you got a dumb chromebook or something you want to just connect if you're on vacation they want to take your your work machine or something you know that that type of thing might work good so, <laughs> home site. Sorry. I, I probably still have an install disk for the home site around here somewhere. Floppy yeah. or something. <laughs> home site and uh, before that, Cold Fusion Studio, if anyone remembers. Yeah. 
Well, that, I thought Home Site was before Cold Fusion Studio. Was it? I don't. I don't remember. Because I mean, I thought Cold Fusion Studio was basically built on top of Home Site. It was just like the same thing with a different name, and because <laughs> it's kind of the evolution. So, but on one of the discs that I had, it had Home Site on it, and so I used that for when Cold Fusion Studio was no longer available and stuff. But yeah, so okay, I think we had a couple of questions in here. Anyone want a question for Ben before we do our Patreon sign off? I think someone asked something though for you so let me get in here real quick somebody oh so you already so someone asked um yeah who chose to go angular with your uh, your company i think you answered in the chat but you want to tell them out out loud um yes uh actually angular was recommended to us by one of our early early engineers jamie krug uh which i'm, I'm sure some of you know him he um uh, as far as modules, like I, I know every, a lot of people use Java Loader. He had created Java Loader Server, or I can't remember what it's called, that fixes memory leaks. Um, anyway, we had planned to use Backbone, which was all the rage at the moment. Um, and Jamie said, uh, let's try this AngularJS thing that uh, I watched a presentation about. It looks pretty cool. And so we tried it, spent a couple weeks learning it, and that was that. Was that. I mean, that was... Uh, that was as much discussion as we had and ended up being a, a super great choice for us. So it's been, it's been pretty great. Very cool. It's game changer. I could throw that in there. <laughs> it's a game changer. If anyone's taking shots. <laughs> <laughs> shots of eggnog. This is getting out of hand. <laughs> and then someone else too asked you if uh, Envision uses CF for APIs. And so. so we don't have a, we don't have a public API. Um, but as far as, uh, Envision is basically a collection of SPA single page applications. Um, so all of the client side code that talks to the server talks through a cold fusion API for the most part. Gotcha. Very cool. And then you said you're using framework one, right? Mm -hmm. Framework one and uh, DI one, which is the dependency injection thing that Sean Corfield had built. Very cool. I know we talked a little bit before, before we started here. So just wanted to make sure everybody knows that too, because I know they want to know all about you, Ben. So <laughs> so how, how long do you spend on your blog posts? I know you're basically solving problems and then, you know, you just sort of translate it. So, I mean, you pump out a lot of blogs. How do you do it? Uh, I, I have a pretty strict, not strict, but I'm a very regimented person. Like I, I thrive inside of structure. Um, that's my, my sort of, uh, uh, strategy for success. And, uh, so I wake up, I go to bed early. I usually go to bed around 10 PM, depending on whether or not that's early for you. <laughs> um, and then I get up at five. So I don't start work until around 10. So between five and 10, uh, it's sort of my personal quiet time, uh, and do my reading, do my writing, do a lot of experimentation. Um, but a lot of it is based on work. So sort of the more things that are on fire at work, essentially the more, <laughs> the more backlog of interesting things, interesting in, to me at least, uh, that I have to look into. So uh, a lot of it is very specific. I mean, most of my blog posts are very specific about like one particular feature or one issue that I ran into. Um, so the scope is not large, right? The scope is fairly focused. It's fairly small. Uh, and then it's usually just sort of documenting what happened and, and how I got around it. Um, so the, the, the best thing for me is just the consistency. And then also I, I write everything down. So if I have even a random idea, I use Trello. So I'll just pop onto my phone, put it into a Trello card, and then I may or may never look at it again. But at least now uh, I have sort of this backlog of ideas simmering in the, in the back of my brain. Yeah, well, that's cool. I have a, a list too, but I don't get to write them as much as I should. But uh, but yeah, so we had a few questions out here. So uh, Luis Mahano, I'm not sure if you know him, but uh, he asked, "Will you be coming to Texas for Into the Box?" <laughs> I'm gonna I'm, let me try. I'm I'm my curiosity is peaked, and I wanna I yeah. wanna get back into it. Yeah, it's not a huge conference either. It's a small hotel. There's not much else going on there except for that. And the Woodlands, if you've never been there, it's amazing. Like you're driving down the street, and I swear it's you're like you're in, you're in a forest. 
And all of a sudden, there's a cutout in the trees, and there's a gas station. And then you drive a little more, and there's a cutout, and there's a freaking super Walmart over there or whatever. <laughs> but it's like everything is covered in trees. Like, uh, Luis had to actually paint his uh, play ha- playhouse thing in the back of his house because it was yellow, and it, everything needs to be dark greens and browns to make it look like the woodlands. You know, like it's the city is all about <laughs> the trees. And so it's like you're in the forest, but there's like a hotel here, and there's a couple of nice restaurants so you're walking distance from it as well that's really cool so oh and and then somebody uh somebody asked oh i think it was charlie said okay for the record how do you pronounce your last name uh nadel Nadel. kind of a long a i guess nadel okay there we go there you go charlie let's see have i been saying it wrong the whole time (laughs) (laughs) there's a lot of pronunciations that i'll accept okay so Brad asks, what are Ben's strength finder top five? What is, str- I don't know what strength, strength finder. finder is. I don't know either. Brad, please clarify. Oh, oh. so uh, Charlie said there's a few more, um, a few more videos going live. Matt Clemente's just went live. So sounds like we have a lot of videos to watch for Christmas. So, oh, and uh, David Levin said there's great barbecue. So yeah, Texas is good for the barbecue for sure. Oh yeah, well that's, I mean that's one of my fondest memories of um, CF objective out in Minnesota was the walk to uh, what was the Brazilian barbecue Fogo place de called? Chao. Yeah, Fogo de Chao. Yeah, and just feeling disgusting and sick afterwards. <laughs> yeah, see, uh, in, uh, there's a Brazilian steakhouse called Las Pampas. In uh, Vegas, there's a Fogo's there too, but Los Pampas, there's always, you always go up to the guy at the front desk and say, Hey, I got it. Uh, they said, come up and ask for a coupon for half off. And they always give you the deal. So you can always get half off. And uh, like I said, from there, it's, we always walk down to the top golf. So you walk it off and hit some golf balls and play some shuffleboard or some, uh, some nice. cornhole or whatever. And then and you stumble back to the hotel because you're full and you're tired after missing all those golf balls. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's definitely good. So, um, so let's see here. I think last thing we'll just say thank you to all the Patreon supporters. I'm not going to butcher your name for the holidays. That's my present to you. So uh, thank you everybody who's a supporter of us and everything. And oh, hold on, Brad's answering here. So Strength Finders is a cool personality test. It tells you a lot about you. And Brad keeps telling me to take it too. So if you go to gallop.com slash um, Clifton Strength. Uh, it's a longer link so i'll put it in the show notes or brad you can put it in the show notes for us and um so yeah so you gotta do your top five things that you know it's it's a pretty cool personality test so it'll help you understand yourself and you know how to work with other people in your team and stuff too so i'll have to do that but um but yeah so i think that's all the questions we have so so ben's uh Saying he's going to be into the box next year. Let's see if we can get him there. <laughs> I do want to get out. I feel guilty. Uh, Gert always invites me out to CF camp. Yeah, and, I'm uh, going to try and get there next year too. I mean, hoping and praying to get there. I uh, think they even mentioned changing the, the time of the year. So if they put it in the summertime, like someone um, mentioned they might, I might be uh, able to take the wife because she's a teacher. So I'm hoping they do that and go visit CF camp because that's pretty cool too. So yeah, it'd be nice to get over there. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, we'll look after you Ben. just let us know if you can come out into the box and it's always a lot of fun. And we have a mariachi band, the only mariachi band at all of the cold fusion conferences. (laughs) It's a lot of fun. People bust out singing and, you know, taco bar and, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we have, we have a lot of fun, so we hope we can make it be good to see you again, but, uh, thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, we really appreciate, uh, you taking the time to spend it with us. We know it's a holidays and everything, but, uh, thanks again for listening to, and, uh, yeah. So any, uh, any final words you want to say? Uh, no, just a huge fan of the show. And, uh, when I, when, when I saw that you guys are making this show, it, it, uh, it felt like the first time I had really seen cold fusion being talked about in a while. I mean, I know Michaela has uh, her show as well and I'm, that's awesome. And I, I just like, 
it, it felt like there was nothing for a couple of years. And now there's, and now there's this sort of a slow groundswell of, of excitement. And, uh, and that fills me with joy. So you guys are a huge part of that. So I'm uh, thrilled to be here and just thank you for everything that Ordis does and yeah. really uh, helping to drive the community forward. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, it's, it's, that's the thing great. too. I mean, it's, there's a lot going on and when i go and find content every week i see how much there is and you know it's easy to miss and that's why this is really important and the cfml newsletter that pete does every month as well like you need to be reminded you know there's so much stuff flies by in twitter and facebook and everything it's it's hard to keep up so that's why we do yeah. it and it's fun and you know we'll have to get you on on the soapbox edition version we'll do more in depth just uh less news more ben uh so we'll, we'll try and do that soon <laughs> now we got you on the camera uh but yeah i'd like to try and get more of those soapbox ones going soon so we'll have to invite you to that but um yeah as charlie says in the chat thanks ben for all you've done and uh and he thanks Audis and, and whatever as well but uh yeah it's as you said it's good ongoing celebration in the community and 100%. With that said, uh, happy holidays, everybody. And we'll be back next week. I'm going to do an episode whether I can find a host or not next Tuesday uh, before you guys all go out and celebrate the end of uh, 2019. So we'll see you then. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Happy Festivus. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, guys. Thank you. All right. Show notes for this episode can be found at cfmlnews.modernizeordie.io, where you can also subscribe to your favorite podcast player like Spotify or iTunes. We also have the link to YouTube to find more videos just like this. The music used in this podcast is under a royalty-free license from Sound.com and Bluetree Audio.